I'm not sure that it's actually crucial that we have uh, translation while I just introduce myself and say, my name is David Kirkham, and among other things, I'm a senior fellow here at the International Law and Religion Center. But I, I wanted to say, this is the 10th year that I have attended this symposium, and what a delight that it is to be able to join you all year after year after year. Seems to me they only get better with the quality of participation and the variety of participants. So thank you all for coming. And I welcome you to this particular session, which we're going to discuss religion and foreign policy. We have with us three distinguished speakers. One of the panelists listed on your program was moved to a different panel. And uh, today I would like to introduce Father Patrick Daly, who is General Secretary of the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Community, who will be our first speaker. He will be followed by Sir Michael Lay, Senior Fellow at the Mar German Marshall Fund of the United States, and then uh, Dr. Pasquale Anacino, a Fellow at the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies, European University Institute. For more information on them, I would urge you, as Elizabeth did in the last uh, session, to go to the programs and read more details. Uh, although Pasquale tells me that his is not the most current bio, for that matter, neither is mine, Pasquale. So, but we are working on that as well. Let me just say, before we launch right into uh, listening to Father Daly, this is a subject that 10, 15 years ago was rarely discussed and would not have merited a place, a panel, an entire panel devoted to the topic not because it wasn't important, but because its importance was not recognized. It really, uh, during the last half of the 20th century, the idea that prevailed in academia and therefore in the policy world to a great extent was that the world was becoming increasingly secular and that eventually religion would find itself as, as having a very insignificant role with regard to the lives of peoples and nations and so forth that uh, in some uh, secular, uh, secularization theorists suggested that eventually it may disappear altogether. After all, it was a, the age of rationalism and science and technology, and uh, the idea was that those would somehow eventually push religion out of that marketplace of ideas. Nothing could be further from, from the truth, and of course, uh, though the forces were going on all along that would change our perspectives on these things. I guess 9-11 was a wake-up call, not in the sense that the terroristic acts that occurred on 9-11 were, were the uh, results of either state action or the acts of a religion, but nevertheless it started people asking the questions, why do some people who have a lot of power do what they do? And then the question was extended from there to, why do peoples, why do nations? Maybe if they're motivated by these forces, these religious forces, then maybe nations as well are going to be more greatly influenced by these motivations than we otherwise suspect or expect. And so the reevaluation of religion and foreign policy in the last 10 years has had some uh, reiteration of some negative views of religion, but also some reiteration of some very, very positive views on how religion can be a force for the improvement or, of relations among nations. I've said enough. I'd like now to uh, turn the, the uh, microphone over to uh, Father Daly. I'd like to congratulate uh, Professor Cole Durham and all his team for this extremely stimulating uh, seminar and symposium we've been attending for the past couple of days. It's been a huge learning curve for me and I, I feel terribly inadequate in the face of such uh, erudition, such expertise in the area of law and uh, religion and particularly the issue of religious freedom across the world and indeed uh, particularly the way in which the historical experience of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints gives a certain perspective to the discussion of this issue. Nonetheless, I feel uh, compelled 
to introduce the uh, European dimension into this discussion, and I hope that the couple of reflections I come up with uh, will help you to understand the state of the question of uh, freedom of religion in European debate and policy at this present time, but also in the way in which it affects uh, the actions of the European uh, Union, the stances it takes uh, in third countries. So the issue here is the effect of religion on foreign policy, to what extent there is a religious dimension to the foreign policy of the European Union. And I'd just uh, like to divide my uh, observations into three separate parts. Firstly, referring, re reflecting on the role of religion within the European Union at the present time. Then uh, the foreign policy of the European Union, if there is such. And finally, to what extent there is respect for the principle of religious freedom in uh, the European Union's many actions uh, in third countries. Now, as you know, the European Union, for those of you who are uh, not uh, European, it is uh, a family of sovereign states who have come together deliberately to work together to build a peace project on the basis primarily of harmonization of their economies, which has led to the creation of a single market which is based on four cardinal principles of freedom of movement, of capital, services, investment, and uh, people, and which uh, attempts and has built, indeed, an architecture of brokerage and a consensus uh, to achieve its political, social, and economic ends. So it is, by any standards, a remarkable uh, human project uh, historical in its proportion, in its size, and in the range of its ambition. It is based on fundamental Christian principles of reconciliation, of overcoming difference, of pardoning the past, and of working together into the future. Born of a Franco-German alliance, it has grown steadily. My own country, Ireland, joined in 1973 and has benefited greatly from membership but also, I think, contributed to its culture. It's no mistake that our, or it's no accident, I should say, that the EU's ambassador in Washington at this present time is David O'Sullivan, an Irishman, head of the EEAS, and he succeeded the former Irish Prime Minister, John Bruton, who was also EU ambassador in the recent past. The most senior civil servant in the European Union is an Irish woman called Catherine Day. So my country, small though it is, and modest though its role may be, has played an important role in the shaping of the European Union. So I'm a very enthusiastic uh, promoter of European integration myself. I believe in it very much. But I believe it also out of Christian conviction and out of my uh, identity as a Catholic priest, working currently for the Catholic bishops of the European Union of 28 member states. We want to contribute to its culture we want to reflect critically on its achievements. We want Catholic social teaching somehow to be reflected in the way in which the European Union creates a better society. But we're aware of the fact, and I salute the presence here of Elisabetta Katanovic from Keck, who is our ecumenical partner in the European Union. And I'd like to also pay a personal tribute to Warren and uh, Lydia Hansen, who were my friends in Brussels and created that important link with the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I think we all believe that we are in a project creating a better, more humane, compassionate and inclusive society. And yet we have come adrift of our Christian moorings. The four founding fathers of the European Union were deeply humane individuals. Three of them were practicing and deeply convinced active Catholics. And so it came as a surprise, really, that 40 years later, when the question of a European constitution was being drafted, that they were so reluctant to acknowledge those Christian roots. So there is, in European culture generally, and certainly in the political world, an embarrassment about our Christian heritage. It's not really polite to acknowledge uh, your religious affiliation. It's not considered acceptable, really, to say, well, yes, I am a Catholic. I happen to share the beliefs of the church. I happen to believe that religion is a positive contributing source to the making of society. 
we pass over it all with a police, with a polite, muffled uh, silence. So the European Union itself is very ambivalent in regard to the religious heritage and the religious ideals which have inspired it. And so it's taking a certain deliberate distance from it. And uh, the reasons for this are twofold. First of all, there is this uh, view that the European Union project is a secular pro project. It's about a whole variety of societies creating a, a, a better world, a better community, based fundamentally on values which are Christian, but which we share, of course, with, with humanists and non-believers as well. And then there is the current uh, political imperative to focus on the place of other religions in our society. And the new European Commission, which came into office just a year ago, and is basically being piloted by a man called uh, Franz Timmermans, who is the first vice president, and who's responsible for not only institutional affairs, but also for the broad issue of dialogue with society. He has moved the goalposts of institutional dialogue with the churches, which is guaranteed and copper fastened into primary law of the European Union in the Treaty of Lisbon. Under Article 17 of that treaty, the European institutions, Parliament, and Commission are uh, obliged to enter into regular, open, transparent dialogue with the religious communities. And that happens at various levels. We and the Keck, for example, work together on more practical issues of policy. We're looking shortly at the question of integration of migrants into our communities. We've looked together at the very contemporary issue of, for example, climate change, and two years ago, when I just started working at Comese, we worked and looked at the issue of European citizenship, which covers questions of identity, including the religious dimension to our identity. So, to conclude, the European Union at the present time is nervous of acknowledging its religious roots. It somewhat takes a, a, a distance from a, being too close to any religious community in the churches, and as a result of the political imperative, it's more keen to develop relationships with the Jewish community and uh, somehow work, up, work out some methods of collaboration with and accommodation to uh, the growing presence of Islam among us. And on the eve of our departure for here, Elisabetta and myself attended a colloquium held by Mr. Timmermans in Brussels on anti-Semitism in contemporary Europe and uh, Islamophobia. I would have thought it only had limited success. And I would have thought, and I don't know whether Keck would share that view, but that the Christian voice was deliberately uh, muffled in, the, in that debate, and I found that regrettable. Now, the second issue is what sort of foreign policy does the European Union have? It is, after all, a, a union of 28 member states, uh, two of whom are members of NATO, with fixed positions on the Security Council of the UN, uh, some others of which are neutral, like Ireland, so that in the areas of foreign policy, because of a whole history of differing relationships with their colonies, of a very uncertain view about Europe's role in the world, uh, the foreign policy of the European Union as such, I think it has to be said, is weak, or at best, only finding its feet. Under the Lisbon Treaty, the European External Action Service was set up, and so it is, if you like, a parallel diplomatic service which works in cooperation with the diplomatic representatives of the member states in third countries, in the United States, but also particularly in other countries, smaller ones, more vulnerable ones, ones riven with conflict in the Middle East, the Far East, and particularly in Africa, where the European Union does a great deal of development work. But I think it has to be insisted that the European Union, the external action service of the European Union, is still in its early days as a diplomatic instrument, as a shaper and maker of foreign policy. And we have seen the weakness of Europe already in the case of Syria, in conflict in the Middle East, and indeed perhaps in conflict areas elsewhere in the world. But uh, Europe doesn't have a European army. Uh, only some of its members are in NATO. 
there are inner tensions within the new members of the European Union and the old ones, and uh, the, 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 the uh, general agreed approach to foreign policy. So where does religion enter into that foreign policy? And I just have two minutes to make one single point. Uh, it is that religious freedom is not a value or is not respected to the degree that Europe would expect in many of the countries in which it is active. And so uh, instructions have been sent, guidelines have been given to European Union officials acting in third countries, and they have been asked to secure at least religious respect for religious freedom. But, and here is the point on which I would end, and it is a very important but, religious freedom in the thinking of the EEAS is an individual freedom and entitlement. They are much more reluctant to support corporate expressions of religious identity in third countries, to support the existence of religious groups, to acknowledge the legal rights and entitlements of churches, to secure their property against attack, and we know that the European Union is in commercial relations as well as security relations with many countries, such as, for example, Saudi Arabia, where religious freedom is not cherished, and if anything, it's uh, being sat upon rather than promoted by these states. So I leave you with those couple of ideas. I hope that I've explained the inner, inner ambivalence of the European Union, the weaknesses of its foreign policy at the present stage, and the difficulty that that poses for it in regard to the issue of religious freedom in third countries where it is active and present. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Father Daly. Uh, Sir Michael Lee, please. Well, good morning, everybody. I'd like to thank very much indeed the organizers of this important event for the invitation to be with you today. Just a couple of words of personal introduction. I began my career as an academic in the field of uh, political science and foreign policy. I then went to work for the European Union institutions in Brussels, where I had a brief pause of some 34 years in the institutions before returning to the academy, or rather to the think tank world. And the subjects that have interested me throughout this period have been foreign policy, international relations, European integration, and I've worked most on the transition of former, former communist countries to democratic political systems over the last two decades. During the last year, I was based in Washington, D.C., where I still am, at the German Marshall Fund, and we had a project that produced a report entitled Faith, Freedom, and Foreign Policy. And in this project, we looked at various dilemmas facing the modern world concerning the overlap between traditional foreign policy goals and objectives and the goal of promoting religious freedom and the protection of religious minorities. Through this work, in which I personally focus primarily on Europe, but comparing the European and the American experience very much, I was struck by the degree to which this topic has become prominent in recent times in most Western countries. The European Union, as well as the United States and Canada, have appointed senior officials responsible for the promotion of religious freedom. In the United States, there was the 1998 International Religious Freedom Law that posed the basis for this. In the EU, as Father Daly mentioned, certain guidelines have been adopted on these subjects to influence policy. And in Canada, there is a similar initiative. Why is there this concern? To what extent can it be translated into effective policies? And what are some of the main dilemmas which it faces? I think the why is because of the increasing pro 
prominence of religious issues, both in our own societies and around the world. We would need a whole symposium to discuss whether the political question about the role of religion is mostly about religion itself or about the instrumentalization of religion, as we've seen in many countries. But one way or the other, the topic has gained in prominence. A couple of decades ago, there was a warning from Samuel Huntington about the risk of a clash of civilizations. And I think it's the concern to avoid such a clash within our own societies, I speak mainly of Europe here, as well as in our relations with countries around the world that have influenced this increasing interest. And then, of course, there, are, there is the rise of various radical forms of religion, uh, radical Islam in particular, but also the use of certain other religions, particularly the Orthodox Church, in the foreign policies of Russia and um, uh, some of the former Soviet republics. The approach in general, if we take the United States and the EU as models, has been to set out certain principles about religious freedom, the protection of religious minorities, and then to establish a kind of mechanism whereby each year there's a reporting process. And both in Europe and in the United States, after extensive and in principle objective studies every year, a list is drawn up of countries of particular concern. And under the 1998 Act in the United States, and under the guidelines in the European Union, the executive authority, the president in the United States, the Brussels institutions in Europe, are expected to make proposals to withhold various forms of assistance and financial support to countries which are of particular concern in the hope of influencing them. Now, there are a number of difficulties with this approach. First of all, there's the objectivity of the reporting, the sources of information, which in itself is a challenge. Then there is the question of which countries are included on the list. In the United States, the International Commission for Religious Freedom draws up a certain list. The State Department then analyzes it and usually comes up with a rather shorter list of countries. It's then up to the president in principle, delegated to the Secretary of State, to indicate which of these countries should be the subject, for example, of withholding of financial assistance if they violated these principles. In the EU, something similar is underway. Putting it rather bluntly, this doesn't work. It's quite good for raising awareness, knowledge, understanding of the issues, but not really in influencing policy. Why doesn't it work? There are a number of reasons for that. First of all, because the goal of promoting religious freedom is a foreign policy objective. It's related to our fundamental values, but it's competing with other foreign policy objectives. And the other objectives are related to national security, access to resources, trade, investment, stability, and so on. And quite rightly, the Secretary of State or the High Rep for Foreign Policy in the EU, the member states of the EU, the Canadian government need to, in the interest of their citizens, take into account also these competing foreign policy goals. The results of this are, for example, that certain countries which are serial violators of fundamental freedom are excluded from the final list drawn up by the State Department and in a notable case such as Saudi Arabia, ever since 2004, have received a waiver from the implications of being designated as a country of political concern because of other national security considerations. Something similar is underway in Europe. This, in my view, is understandable. Governments do pursue competing goals, but it's there, and I think it's something we have to reckon with. Secondly, there is a dilemma as to whether the whole subject of religious freedom should be hived off in this way to a particular administration, or whether it should be mainstreamed into all the policies that a government or institutions like the EU institutions should pursue. 
the United States, Canada, and the EU have chosen to set up a specific small administration and bureaucracy dedicated to this task. It's quite good in developing expertise and in raising awareness, but there is a certain tendency to say, well, this is being dealt with by those people, now we can get on with business as usual. So the dilemma between mainstreaming on the one side and including this policy area in diverse fields of activity or setting up a specific administration um, responsible uh, for it. I think we have seen the, the effects of this dilemma. Thirdly, another major and perhaps the predominant reason why these initiatives so far have yielded only modest results is because they are all addressed to states. The, in, the, uh, the US Act on International Religious Freedom of 1998, the initiatives taken by the European Union, all have to do with the policies of states. And yet, the main threats to religious freedom and to religious minorities today come to a large degree from non-state actors. And we simply don't have a mechanism for dealing with that. In the European Union, which is the framework that I know best, dealing with states comes naturally. The countries over which we have most influence are the countries that have applied for membership. And there you can see a real impact in this field, where the countries in Eastern Europe, in the Balkans, or indeed Turkey. The fact that countries have applied for membership in the European Union has given us the right to keep a very close eye on what's taking place in those societies, and even to stipulate, for example, in the case of Turkey, how non-Muslim minorities should be treated, the property issues related to Orthodox Christian um, foundations in Turkey, the very large non-Sunni Alevi minority in Turkey. We have actually been rather interventionist in the case of a state that has applied for membership, with mixed results, I would say. When it comes to countries further afield, we have to have a softer touch, as they would rather tend to challenge our leverage and our right to interfere actively in what many of them seem to, seem to be internal affairs. But if we look at the world today, the main problems in this area, I think, come from the rise of radical organizations, notably Islamic, but not exclusively so, where religion is a criterion for discrimination and even for violence. This is particularly visible, obviously, in North Africa, the Middle East, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa today, where there are extensive persecutions, where people are being treated with tremendous brutality only because of their religious affiliation. This has been clear in Kenya. You remember the dreadful incident in which people were taken off a bus, asked to recite a few lines from the Koran. If they could not, they were summarily um, executed. You'll recall also the case of the Coptic Christians from Egypt who were among workers in Libya who were picked out by radical groups in that country, marched down to the beach and beheaded purely because of their Christian affiliation. There are some one and a half million Christians who've been displaced from Syria and from um, Iraq and who form an important part of the huge movements of migrants about which we are reading uh, every day and which perhaps pose the leading challenge to the European Union since the decline of communism. In summary, therefore, I would say there are a number of reasons why the questions of religious freedom and the protection of uh, religious minorities have gone up the agenda in the US, Canada, the EU, and other countries around the world. We have tackled it in a rather bureaucratic administrative way that I briefly described with certain modest results. But now we face challenges which are so fundamental that I believe it's time to rethink our approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Michael. Dr. Anacino. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. I would like to thank, first of all, uh, the
BYU Center for International Studies of uh, Law and Religion for inviting me to speak here in the, this symposium. Actually, I must say that this is quite a record. David can correct me because this is for me the second year in a row speaking. So it's quite a record. I'm actually speaking in the same panel because last year I was in a similar panel signaling what David was saying in his introduction that this topic is really growing and there is a growing interest on, um, on this uh, kind of a conversation. And then uh, let me thank also the BYU students. As a former adjunct professor here at BYU for the last couple of years, uh, every year I admire uh, the work they do uh, on this symposium. And I mean, we should really be thankful to all of them for uh, their dedication to the cause uh, of religious freedom. Uh, and then, of course, I would like to thank, uh, to thank Professor Cole Durham and all the staff of the, of the center for what they do all over the world, uh, every day, uh, night and day, I must say, for also helping us that in our part of the world uh, try to work on the topic of uh, freedom of religion, relationship between church and state, um, and so on. Now, uh, as you have heard from uh, the other two speakers, uh, uh, they actually did a lot of the job uh, I was planning to do, so they saved the time for me, so I can, I can elaborate more on other points. I'm, I'm very happy about that, and so thank you very much uh, for, the, uh, for the kind of topic you touched on. What I would suggest, um, first of all, I would like to, uh, to outline a basic uh, uh, methodological issue. I mean, the, the title of the panel is uh, Religion and Foreign Policy. Uh, and I would like to make a distinction here, a distinction between uh, religion and foreign policy and religious freedom and international affairs. Now, uh, I am probably the only lawyer in this panel, and this for me is, is quite important, uh, because I see a difference in there. I mean, there is a growing interest on religion and foreign policy, and religion and foreign policy for me touches every kind of topic where religious groups are important actors in foreign policy. And this not only concern the right to freedom of religion or belief. Religious groups are important actors in foreign policies on several issues and several topics of agenda. Think about uh, uh, development aid or this kind of stuff that many religious groups do abroad. I mean, I consider that also to be part uh, of the study of religion and foreign policy because religious groups are very important actors also in that field. While my presentation today will be mainly focused on what I define as uh, uh, religious freedom and international studies, because there is, uh, as you have heard uh, from the other two presentations, a growing interest on what religious freedom does at international level, how is it protected, and who are the actors. So my presentation will be really focused on, uh, on the second part of that methodological division uh, I would suggest. And in, uh, in a kind of a biblical spirit, not with, uh, with no pretense to be a kind of a lawgiver, I would suggest a kind of a pentalogue. So five issues uh, I would like to suggest. So let me mention all of them so that this is what uh, I can anticipate what could be uh, for you to, to take over from this uh, remaining 10 minutes of my presentation. So here are my, uh, are my five points, which are mainly taken from uh, publications I have been doing and on a pending article I maybe will um, submit for the, this issue, this issue of, the, of the symposium. So the first point, international religious freedom is nowadays part of a global conversation and a global struggle. I will elaborate on this point. Second point, within, within this global environment, there are several political platforms that often operate jointly, and this is often seen in coalition made at the UN level. Third point, religious freedom is not, I want to underline, not value neutral. We should struggle for what we believe it is true. And I mean, what we believe it is true, I think it's an important point that I will elaborate when I will deal with the third point. Fourth point, religious freedom is not, let me stress again, not a privileged right. And my last point, uh, and I hope will be the, not the last one really, religious freedom is a right at a serious risk of disappearance. So let me go back to the first point. International religious freedom is nowadays part of a global conversation and a global struggle. You have heard uh, from the other two speakers, mainly a, I would define a, a Western perspective of religious freedom, and there is a reason for that, because they have been talking about what the US has done in, from 1998 with the International Religious Freedom Act, 
how action came recently, especially from 2013, with the, uh, the approval of the EU guidelines for freedom of religion or belief. But I want, what I want to suggest with my first point is that the, the real conversation and struggles are much global. I mean, the only actors are not only Western countries, but the issue of religious freedom nowadays is a really a global issue with global actors. Think about the relevance of the right to religious freedom and how we define that right, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis the actions of the Russian Federation of the Russian Orthodox Church. Think of this about the organization of the Islamic Conference at the UN level. Think of this about what is going on, for instance, in India and how uh, the issue of conversion is a burning issue in India. Or think about the issue of religious freedom in China and how religious freedom is often suppressed and uh, people are not allowed to freely profess their religion. And again, this is, uh, and this is really a, a direct connection with my second point. What we can see nowadays, and especially but not like directly endorsing a kind of anti Antonian view, kind of uh, uh, part of civilizational platform on uh, where states where they stand on the right to freedom of religion and belief. And we have seen this many times. So, for instance, the, U uh, the US and Europe were allied on the so-called blasphemy resolution saga at the UN. The blasphemy resolution saga is uh, uh, um, a, a several, over several years, the organization of the Islamic Conference has proposed the approval of the um, UN blasphemy resolution. And the UN, uh, at the UN level, the US, especially the US Commission on International Religious Freedom and the European Union fought strongly uh, to avoid the approval of the, of the blasphemy resolution because they thought that that would be contrary to the notion of religious freedom that we have, which is a right that belongs to individuals and not to ideas. So you should be free to criticize ideas in the name of human rights and religion were understood as part of ideas. And many country, uh, countries would object to that because for them, even the, for, even the you, you, you don't have a right to freedom of expression in criticizing uh, the, the religion as an idea. So uh, at the UN level, we see many of these platforms, a coalition among different states of the world on several issues that really shapes uh, the definition of the right to freedom of religion uh, or belief. And because my uh, predecessors here um, from this podium have spoken about the US and the European Union. I would like to focus on that because I really think that there is a kind of what we, we, we know that yesterday was approved the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Partnership on the liberalization of the, uh, of the economy uh, from the, the US and Asian countries. And there is a pending treaty on the so-called TTIP, Transatlantic Partnership. But what I would suggest is that what is going on is that there is really a kind of a transatlantic, transatlantic partnership for the promotion and protection of freedom of religion or belief. There are uh, nevertheless uh, three things to be said in this respect. US and Europe have different, different internal approaches to the protection of the right to religious freedom, but, but they are intensely enough working together at the global level. There are of course still things that need to be worked out. Even at the terminological level in official documents, sometimes there is disagreement between the US and Europe on how we should call and define religious freedom. If we go through the official document, we would find sometimes uh, the notion of religious freedom, sometimes religious liberty, sometimes freedom of religion or belief. Uh, behind this uh, uh, kind of can be very tricky legal terminology, I would suggest that there are substantial differences to be addressed that flow from a different understanding of the right at stake. Uh, what US and Europe also should do and I think we have seen also from today's presentation, is that if they want to promote uh, um, uh, the right to freedom of religion and belief, they should uh, enlarge uh, the coalition of uh, uh, states that uh, promote their vision of freedom of religion and belief, because in a kind of post-colonial setting, many of the actions of the US and the European Union are sometimes understood as a kind of colonial imposition of a given right, uh, the given notion of the right to freedom of religion and belief on third states. And actually, I must say that it is, uh, the, this, this allows me to go to my third point. It is true that the US and European Union have a kind of a given notion of the right of freedom, of freedom of religion and belief, and we should not deny that, because that is part of our history and a part of who we are. Now, let me elaborate, because I think this is a kind of a very important issue to underline. 
The right to freedom of religion or belief, as you understand it, and it is as codified in international convention, does not come from nowhere. We should not forget that before the approval of the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the mainstream understanding of the right focused on a regime of minority rights, which was very, very much focused, as Samuel Moyne has recently put it in, uh, on his, in his recent publication, collective, practical, and political dimension of religious affiliation. On the contrary, as recently demonstrated by genealogical, uh, genealogical reconstruction of the approval of Article 18 of the Universal Declaration by Linde Lindquist, the post-war documents focused on individual conscience and individual consensus choice. To this respect, the approval of Article 18, I, I would suggest, was unprecedented uh, as far as the history of humanity was at that time. And in fact, this definition was heavily influenced by Christian personalism in order to emphasize spiritual freedom. As Moyne underlines at the, time of the, uh, at the time of the convention, the right to change, uh, the right to change your religion was really unprecedented and strongly motivated by the perception of threat to historic missionary activity. In fact, several Muslim states abstained during the vote at the General Assembly. Therefore, I mean, we should really be aware of this fact that uh, the, the, the fact that Article 18 grants the right to change your religion was first of all unprecedented at that time and is still very much very contested in many parts of the world. Now, shall we just forget about defending the right to change your religion because other people and other countries do not believe in that? I, should, I think we should not because that is part of who we are. And I think that from a universalist perspective, it's an important right to be defended. And you should have your right to change your religion and the right to leave uh, the, religious, uh, the religious group in which you are. Now, there have been uh, several critiques addressed to the right to freedom of religion or belief. We have seen this in, uh, in the first presentation in the plenary session by Professor uh, David uh, Lidl. And we see that, uh, especially the, when international religious freedom is at stake, there are several critiques addressed to the right to freedom of religion and belief. Some of these critiques are instrumentalization and politicization of religious freedom because religious freedom is used as a proxy for something else. US unilateralism versus multilateralism. Uh, not universal, uh, uh, the, um, religious freedom is not a universal concept. Religious freedom is a privileged right as compared to other rights. I would suggest that there are um, certain degrees of truth in some of those critiques. For instance, we know that religious freedom as any other human rights, I want to underline this as any other human rights, can be the object of instrumentalization and politicization. Then, uh, I, I, I thought that was for me, sorry. <laughs> then um, there is an issue with uh, mult, uh, multilateralism and unilateralism, but we also know that, you know, when you look at the, U, uh, at the UN Council for Human Rights and you look at the states who are supposed to protect human rights, can you really claim that multilateralism is, multilateralism is better than unilateralism? Of course, I would suggest that it's good that there are more and more states involved in the promotion and protection, but sometimes we should not overemphasize the role of multilateralism. And as I have already uh, worked on this issue of uh, not, universal, uh, not universal concept as far as religious freedom belief is concerned, and I want to suggest that religious freedom, if we look at the policies that are at stake, is not as privileged as other human rights because if we look at, the, for instance, uh, one clear indicator, the amount of money which is spent on the promotion and protection of religious freedom and belief, you would find very easily which is much lower as compared to the amount of money which is spent on the promotion and protection of other rights of other rights. Just, uh, just to conclude, and my final point, because otherwise David will cut me down, uh, relig uh, religious freedom is at risk of disappearance. I would say that there are five main points because of that. And I won't elaborate on that, but uh, I will leave that for the Q&A session. So there is, of course, an issue with the amount of resources that are devoted to the protection uh, of the right to freedom of religion belief, which is, believe me, not very high as compared to, I can elaborate on the exact amount that the US and Europe spend on this. Then there is an issue, I mean, especially the Western world, we are uh, nowadays a post-Christian society. And therefore, when you, when you think about and discuss about issues related with religion and religious freedom, I would suggest that there is a kind of cognitive block I mean, people that don't care about religion and religious freedom, it's very tough to explain to them 
why and how this is relevant. And this is particularly true when you deal with high-level bureaucracies. They usually are composed by people that are, on average, quite secular or secularized people. I mean, if you go down to Foggy, Foggy Bottom or if you go to Brussels, I can tell you that the majority of people are, you know, average secular people, and it's very hard to explain to them why uh, religion or religious freedom is irrelevant. Then there is an issue of clashing of rights. I mean, because, because there is not only the right to freedom of religion with this protest, but there are or, or any kind of other rights. And the classical clash nowadays is, of course, we should not deny that the, the clash that is everywhere between religious freedom on one side and LGBT rights on the other side. And then, final point to conclude, there is the incoherence from pretended supporters of the right to freedom of religion and belief. And the example was made before by both speakers. I mean, you can claim that you are for religious freedom, that you protect religious freedom, and then and, and at every single occasion you have to remark that right, you just to pretend to, you know, to put more value on other issues than the right to freedom of religion and belief. This has happened constantly with the Gulf countries. This has happened constantly. I and mean, if you think about uh, the uh, International Religious Fri uh, Freedom Act in 1998, there was only one, one person sanctioned under that attack. That was uh, uh, Narendra Modi. And Narendra Modi wa was very much welcomed in the US when he came last year uh, and he gave a great tour and so on. So even pretended supporters of the rights the many of the time pretend to you know, put more value on other issues than the right to freedom of religion and religion belief. Therefore, I would suggest, of course, that we are all involved in a very complex uh, uh, conversation and discussion. We should aim at having a, a global as and la a large possible partnership that we have, but we should not forget that there are certain, certain things that we can really claim that are universal, such as that nobody can be jailed or persecuted because he changed his religion or because what he believes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And I, I want to assure you, Pasquale, if I were ever to cut you off, it would be lovingly and with the greatest reluctance. <laughs> and so um, I enjoyed very much the, listening to all three panelists and would encourage you now with the 10 minutes we have to uh, pose your own questions. I'm only going to take one at a time, but please raise your hands and uh, we'll... Yes, please. Thank you. Belvinder Sergio from Canada. Uh, this question is for all of the panel members. There was a reference made by uh, Michael Lee earlier about the departments or offices of religious freedoms that were being set up by countries such as Canada or the United States. It's a two-part question. The first is, what do you believe is the political impetus uh, for the governments to set these departments up? And secondly, what, if any, impact do you think they'll have on the global scale? A volunteer to begin. Yes, Sir Michael. Very briefly, I would say in terms of political impetus, it's mainly domestic political pressure from groups with an interest in religious freedom um, that has led to these developments. Uh, in the EU, it comes out through the European Parliament, in the US, the Congress, um, various NGOs, various religious bodies, and so on. I think that's the main um, reason why this has happened, apart from what's going on in the world outside that I mentioned in my presentation. In terms of impact, I think there has been some impact, but it's usually uh, behind the scenes rather than more open. Um, it's claimed anyway by diplomats that in some countries the risk of being put on the list of countries of particular concern have led countries, for example, not to adopt certain discriminatory legislation. And you can cite a number of successful cases. In the EU's particular case, as I mentioned, we have had a high degree of leverage with countries applying for membership. And if you look at the treatment of religious minorities in Serbia, for example, there has been some opening up. Turkey, uh, the treatment of the Alevis, the treatment of uh, Greek Orthodox uh, foundations, some small steps. But I don't really think one could claim um, a very high level of impact and effectiveness overall. Thank you. Father Daly? I, <clears throat> I can't give you a technical answer on that because uh, it, it, is, it concerns uh, 
a, for a matter of policy. I think that there is a growing conviction uh, among, certainly in the United States and Canada, that a religion is an added value uh, in creating a society which is at peace with itself. Uh, the European Union, as I outlined in my presentation, is slightly ambivalent about its own religious heritage and uh, shy of admitting that religion is something positive in the, in the makeup of a, a better society. Nonetheless, I think that because, uh, as Sir Michael uh, mentioned, of the pressures from the European Parliament, uh, particularly in Europe, that the question of a commissioner on supervising, monitoring and promoting uh, religious freedom in the third countries in which the European Union is present is out of a political imperative, a, a desire to be seen to tick a particular box. And given that uh, it's better to do something positive than not to do anything, I would say that that's the motivation. Now, whether it makes an impact in uh, third countries, uh, particularly where there's conflicting interest, especially in the area, for example, of uh, health programs, of uh, development programs in these countries where that is the political priority and securing religious uh, tolerance or uh, freedom of religious and belief would be a second priority there. And in the hierarchy of priorities, I don't uh, see at the moment that that would be, from the European Union perspective, uh, top of the list. And Dr. Anacino. Okay. Uh, I would sub subscribe to what uh, Michael said before. Uh, I, I would elaborate on the, on the first point in a sense which is completely true that most of the time comes from internal politics. And I would add to that that, especially in the US and also in the European case, came from internal dynamics mainly related to Christians. So were Christians asking because of Christian persecution that uh, institution would do something uh, to, you know, promote and protect uh, the right to freedom of religion and belief. Uh, this, is, this is normal, you know, it's part of the majoritarian political culture in, uh, in our continent, so we should not be surprised because of that. And doesn't mean that the actions are, are biased because of that. Um, I want, uh, and on the second point on, on the issue of impact, uh, it, of course, it of course depends on how you define impact and what's in impact, because for me, if you, are, if you have been saved through this action to save the life of one person, that would still be a terrific impact, you know? On a, on a, on a general level, again, uh, it also depends on the kind of uh, negotiating power that you have uh, with the country you are dealing with. So probably, if you are uh, at a table with China and you put the issue of religious freedom there, probably you're not gonna have the kind of same effect that you would have with countries that are applying for EU membership, for instance. Therefore, it, there is always a kind of political deal to be, to be made there. Thank you. Another question. Yes. And this will be our last. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question goes to Professor Michael Lee. You made allusion in your presentation to some cases of violence, radicalization, and all that, especially in West Africa. My question is this. One, those cases of violence, were they engineered by the government of those countries or by some individual groups? from your research. Secondly, to tackle such cases of violence, do you think the EU alone can do it, or is better to do it in a collaborative effort with the government of those countries? Thank you. To reply quickly to the question, I think most of the cases of violence concern come from non-state actors, not from states themselves. But I think very often the states lack the structures, the strength uh, sufficiently to prevent such uh, outbreaks from occurring. But as I said in my presentation, I think the main challenge is no longer states. And that's why the structures that we've set up are not really appropriate for them. I agree with the spirit of your question entirely that these issues are fundamentally to be dealt with within the countries directly concerned by the people's concern by the authorities concerned. And there might even be some suspicion as to the involvement of third countries, whether in the EU, North, Af North America, or elsewhere, um, in countries where we have no direct legal responsibility of our own. So I think local ownership 
and local commitment to tackling these issues is fundamental. And where that exists, then countries like the US or the EU or Canada can come in and provide support. But the initiative must come from within the countries themselves. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased that we still have most of the day ahead of us so we can continue these discussions formally. But I would ask you to, with me, thank our panelists one more time.